check, 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 check. And um, um, I mean, it's the maybe a little bit louder, just a little. Um, and we have a mic for questions too, right? Okay, because we we're gonna need one. I did this. I did put that into my request. <laughs> Hello, hi, thank you all so much for coming. Um, so I think that we are going to get started. Um, so first I just want to introduce myself. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Alexandra Montgomery. I am the manager of the Center for Digital History here at the Washington Presidential Library. Um, so I am here giving this talk in that capacity, but also and especially, um, just make sure this is working, uh, to tell you a little bit and promote this project that we've been running through the Center for Digital History. Um, Argo Maps, uh, Argo stands for American Revolutionary Geographies Online. You will all find in front of your seats a beautiful sticker promoting the project. Um, we also have magnets if you are interested. Um, and so Argo, as I mentioned, it stands for American Revolutionary Geographies Online. Uh, it's a project that's being co-run by ourselves here at the library, as well as our friends at the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. And the idea is that we are bringing together maps of North America on a whole range of different scales from, you know, just tiny little survey plats to maps of all of North America that were made between 1740 and 1800. So capturing the full sweep of the revolutionary period as it's most broadly understood. Uh, so these are maps that are coming from our collection. They're also maps that are coming from many other collections. This is a highly collaborative project. We have uh, 21 active partners at the moment. And at the moment, the current web portal, if you go to argomaps.org, which I encourage you all to do, um, we have over 2,000 maps with another 2,000 maps in the pipeline to be digitized very shortly. So it's a fun and it's an exciting project. Um, and this series of talks is meant to both, of course, teach you all about fun maps, but also promote the work of this project um, as a really fantastic uh, site for you to see, learn about, think more about maps during this crucial 18th century period. Okay, so today, let me just go back to my first slide. Um, this, is a, this is part of a three lecture series. So the first lecture was on um, the Fry Jefferson map of Virginia. Can I see a show of hands? Was, were any of you here for that one? Okay, so like 50% of the crowd, that's pretty good. It's, if you weren't there, that's fine. Um, I'll be going over some of the basic framing information again. Uh, and if you'd like to watch that one, that is available uh, on YouTube if you go to our, the Mount Vernon YouTube page and go to our live streams. So then there's this one, and then next month we'll be doing the third talk in this series on the Mitchell map of North America. These, all three of these maps were made in basically 1755, that's simplifying things a little bit. All of them were made by colonials. They were not made by Londoners or people um, in England, although some of them were produced in England. They were made by colonial people. Um, and they are all considered to be, you know, the most important maps of one of the most important periods for mapping in North America. So what do I mean by that? This is where it's going to be a little bit repetitive if you were at that Fry Jefferson um, talk, but it's a refresher. It's good for all of us. I have to refresh myself all the time on these things. So the 1750s. The 1750s is an extremely important moment for maps in North America. This 1750 year, more or less, this is a pivot point where we see maps going from being really kind of rarefied objects, which most people in the colonies aren't going to have seen or owned or interacted with. They're only going to be owned by like real top, top elites, government officials. After around 1750, that changes. Maps become much more accessible. There are many, many more of them, and more people have them. So part of this is driven simply by um, demand around the, the changing geopolitical circumstances of the time. And people want them both to learn more information about these changing political, uh, geopolitical circumstances, but also, uh, um, I just want to emphasize, because they look nice on a wall. Um, show of hands, who has maps on your walls at home? 18th century people, they're just like us. 
Um, so this is obviously from quite a bit later. This is also the same image I showed last time, but again, I still think that it's a good representation. Uh, that maps were also just sort of household objects. Maps were things people had in their homes. They were using them, sure, but they were also considered to be material decorative objects. And that is part of how we can explain this explosion in popularity. So we get more of them and people want them because they want to know more about the world, but they also are nice decorative objects. After this moment, the 1750 moment, you also start to see more maps in public. This is especially true of our big maps. The Evans map is not necessarily a big map, although we'll get more into that later. So this, of course, is a very famous uh, image of Congress voting independence. And on the back wall of Independence Hall, you can see sort of two square frames. You can't quite tell what's in there, but they are maps. They are two large maps. Um, and in any kind of public or semi-public governmental space, you are very likely in this moment to be interacting with seeing these large maps, much in a similar way where if you turn around behind you, you can see large maps on the wall today. So in some sense, just like Independence Hall. Ha, 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 don't tell Philadelphia I said that. Because uh, maps are becoming increasingly available and because they're consumer products, what you also see around the 1750 moment is that they are being advertised in colonial newspapers. So this advertisement is particularly relevant to the talk today because it is specifically for the map that we are gonna talk about today. This is, a map, this is an advertisement that was published in the Pennsylvania Gazette, which is one of the sort of biggest and most important colonial newspapers at the time, um, by Lewis Evans, the creator of this map, advertising that the map that we're talking about today was for sale. And this is really, this is only about a fourth of this advertisement. We'll look at a little bit more of it later on, but it is a very long, very detailed, very uh, excited uh, sounding advertisement for this particular map. But for right now, the main takeaway is that um, people are getting more maps, maps are being advertised more, there are just more maps all the time everywhere after the 1750 moment. Because of course we are at Mount, uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon, um, and also as we'll see, the Evans map has a particular import to George Washington himself. Um, I also just want to talk a little bit about George Washington's relationship with maps. Washington was a map guy. He made maps, he collected maps, he was associated with maps. So I showed this image uh, in the Fry Jefferson uh, lecture. I pointed out that the family here is focused on a map in front of them. They are also holding various tools of map making. Um, I wanted to include this today, especially because as a fun update, uh, this is the map that they're looking at, specifically. It is a map of the new federal city. It's a map of Washington, D.C. Um, someone had asked in the previous lecture, what, you know, what is Martha pointing at? Well, it turns out, um, I was very excited to learn, that she's believed to be pointing at lands that the Washingtons had purchased in the new federal city. Um, so they're interacting with this map in a very direct way, where Washington is being associated with the tools of the map-making trade, with the birth of this new federal city, and with specific lands there. So that's just one of the ways in which, in public, Washington is associated with maps as part of his public persona. As I mentioned, of course, he also made maps. Washington was a surveyor. This was his first sort of real professional job, uh, beginning when he was very young. Uh, you know, as young as 13, he was learning the, learning the uh, tools you need to survey. And then by his late teens, he was actually out there doing it. So this is images from our collection here of some of his surveying equipment. And then this is an image of a, one of his surveys that we actually have here. So Washington was able to not just look at maps and think about maps and what they might mean, but he was able to make maps. He knew how to do this, and he did it for pretty much his entire life. In addition uh, to making his own maps, he was also a real consumer of maps. I wouldn't say that Washington is your typical late 18th century man. I think we all know that he was not exactly typical. But he was in the sense that he was very interested in maps and acquired quite a number of them, although I would say a higher number than maybe your, you know, your average sort of middling or lower sort colonist might have had. So this is a page from one of his financial ledger books where it records a payment uh, for the purchase of a map. This is the um, 1770 uh, Henry, Henry, what's his last name? John Henry map of Virginia. Um, and there are lots of these in his financial papers if you go through them. You can see most clearly the extent of Washington's map consumption when you look at his probate inventory. So the probate inventory is a document that was prepared after Washington's death. They are going through his estate, you know, sort of physically walking through the rooms of Mount Vernon, recording everything that's in there, assigning it a price. And we use this really extensively at Mount Vernon, um, sort of in all different departments. This is a document we use extensively to think about how to furnish the mansion to interpret it so it looks as much like it did in Washington's time as possible. And at the library, we use it a lot to think about what books Washington owned, because all of his books are listed out in this document. But so are his maps. 
Uh, this is not all of the places where maps are mentioned. Maps and atlases are mentioned in that probate inventory. He had over 57 flat maps in addition to very many atlases. So he had quite a significant map collection. But it's from this document that I, we can say with some certainty, you know, what maps Washington had. Um, and the answer is, you know, a lot. And I'm not sure if it's on this. Uh, is the Evans map on this one? Good, I love audience interaction. Ah, yeah, here it is. Evans map of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Although, as we will see, that is not the, this is not the only reason why we knew that George Washington had the Evans map. He was using it actively, and we'll get into some specific examples of that as we go along. So that's the background. The sum takeaway here is after 1750, more and more people in the colonies have maps. There are more maps being made. They are better. They are more accurate. They are more detailed. And people are uh, interacting with them more, especially George Washington. Um, the reason why we have the Argo Project in part headquartered here is in part because of Washington's strong association with maps and mapping, as well as I should mention the very generous donation by Richard H. Brown of his map collection in 2019, which um, the maps on the wall behind you are, are copies of maps from that collection. Um, and those maps are all in the Argo collection as well. Um, so let's move on to some of the more specific content. Now it is finally time to talk about the Evans map. So what is the Evans map? The Evans map is this. And so I say Evans map, but the actual title of this map is, and I'm going to have to squint here, give me a moment, a general map of the middle British colonies in America, viz. Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Rhode Island of Aquanchinogue, the country of the Confederate Indians, comprehending a Shinogue, and I'm definitely pronouncing that improperly, but he's spelling it improperly, so that's fine. Um, their place of residence, Ohio, uh, their deer hunting countries, uh, Kuksarage and Skinnerade, their beaver hunting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very, very long title. It's like an entire cent paragraph. So we're just going to call it the Evans map, if that's okay with everybody. That's good? Okay. <laughs> so here it is. And as you can see, it is, in fact, a map of the middle British colonies in America. So middle colonies, if you want to cast your mind all the way back to seventh grade social studies or whenever you learned about the basic divisions of the colonies, um, it's Pennsylvania, um, it's uh, New York, it's, it's the ones that aren't New England or the South, basically. It's a catch-all term for that. Um, but what this map really is a map of is, I would say, the Ohio country. Um, so Hans, who has heard the term Ohio country before? Because this is one that, okay, a decent chunk of you, which is good. This is one that gave me a really hard time for a really long time, because the Ohio country is not, in fact, the state of Ohio, which is confusing to me, and I think a little rude. Uh, but instead, the Ohio country is this large area centered around the Ohio River Valley that is deeply contested during the 18th century. So this is a great map from Wikipedia, because Wikipedia actually has some really fantastic maps um, that shows more or less the area that we're talking about when we're talking about the Ohio country. So it does include the modern state of Ohio. It also includes parts of Pennsylvania, parts of Indiana, sort of this whole middle near west, right? Whether or not it's the Midwest is a topic I leave to my friends that are from the region. I don't want to dip my toe in that contentious discourse. Um, but this more or less is what we're talking about when we're talking about the Ohio country, and this is the subject of Evans's map. So why? Who cares? Why is there this map of just the Ohio country? Well, the reason is, is that this is a hotly contested location in the 1750s, um, and really afterwards as well. Um, the 1750s is the moment when we see the outbreak of the Seven Years' War, also known as the French and Indian War, which is a massive contest between the British and French empires, essentially over the fate of North America, right? So at the end of this, in 1763, the British are victorious. The French Empire is removed from North America. Um, and it, in many ways, lays the stage for the American Revolution later on. But when this map is made, and when the Evans map is made, um, when the Evans map, the Fry Jefferson map, as well as the Mitchell map, that has not been decided yet. All three of these maps are made during this lead up period where the tensions are running hot, there's already been fighting, everyone knows that a full scale war is coming and everyone knows that the stakes are incredibly, incredibly high. And the Ohio Valley is one of really two major hotspots where both the British and the French are claiming that they have full exclusive right to this land. Um, the other one is sort of up um, by Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. But for the purposes of this, we're just gonna focus on the Ohio country, which you can see in this map, which is of course a modern map, but I think useful because it does superimpose uh, some of the modern state borders so you can orient yourselves a little bit better. It's really that whole striped area down through the middle here 
And then the really, the really contentious area, of course, is the area that has all the little dots on it, little flags and little triangles. That is the Ohio country. So we're talking about the area really around Pittsburgh is really kind of ground zero for this conflict. And that, of course, is exactly what Evans's map is of. And that is not a mistake. That is why Evans makes this map. And we know that's why Evans makes this map, because he tells us. Um, accompanying this map is a 34-page pamphlet uh, that also has an incredibly long name. <laughs> the, uh, Geographical, Historical, Political, Philosophical, and Mechanical Essays, the first containing an analysis of the general map of the Middle British Colonies in America and of the country of the Confederate in in Indians, a description of the face of the country, the boundaries of the Confederates, and the maritime navigations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're going to call this the analysis. Is everyone okay with that? Okay, great. <laughs> Um, and in this, he lays out the reasons behind the map, the sources he's using for the map, um, and he really just, it's in a way that is very helpful and not available to us from any other maps, lets us know why he is making the map that he's making. And he tells us the reason he's making this map is because he wants to emphasize the importance of the Ohio country, tell us that it's this Ohio country that is going to determine the fate of all of North America, um, and what he wants, he's a good you know, British colonist, he wants the British to take control of this region in a way he thinks that they have not. Um, and he lays it out like, very, very clearly. So this is a really um, pretty to the point quote, which is from, from it. Um, and I've sort of bolded the most uh, crucial part of it where what he's doing here is really remarkable because he's linking um, sort of activity in the Ohio country. He is talking about the role of indigenous peoples, although it's not present in this block quote. And he's also linking it explicitly to slavery. So this is like, there's a lot going on in this quote. Uh, but to just read the essential bolded part, what he is saying is that if the French settle back of us, that is in the Ohio country, behind all of these coastal settlements, um, the English either must submit to them or have their throats cut and lose all of their slaves. So this is a pitch in part to get the southern colonies on side, but it's also his vision of what the stakes are here. If we don't get control of the Ohio country, if we let the French take over the Ohio country, we're all going to become French or we're all going to die. And he, kind of, he then kind of says in the next paragraph that, like, look, I know we all hate the French, but clearly that's the better alternative here. So, so I mentioned native presence, and I want to talk about that a little bit, because that is one of the ways in which this map is really striking, especially in comparison to the Fried Jefferson map, is there is a, Lewis Evans is paying a great deal of attention to the presence and the role of indigenous people. And we'll get into the why in just a second. So in his uh, pamphlet, in the analysis, he goes into great detail about the specific territories of different indigenous nations. On the map itself, um, he, he says in the pamphlet, you know, I haven't shown all of them because I don't know where all of these communities are, but I've done my absolute level best to show you where all these places are. Um, and there is an awful lot of writing on this map, which if you are here in person, you'll get to go into the next room after I'm done talking and see the actual map. Um, or else you can also go on argomaps.org. Um, and take a look at the map for yourself, which I do recommend doing because it lets you zoom in. It lets you really take your time with this. And one of the things that you'll notice is the, uh, first of all, the amount of writing on this map. There are whole paragraphs kind of inserted into blank and semi-blank areas where Evans goes into great detail about various things. And one of the things he's clearly very concerned about are the extent of the territory, particularly of what he refers to here as the five or six nations, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy or the Iroquois Confederacy, um, as well as other affiliated indigenous peoples. And the reason for that is not simply because, you know, he has ethnographic interest or, you know, he uh, really likes indigenous people, although I think he respects them, but like is a strong word. Um, it's because he sees the presence of these people and specifically of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy as really key to British claims in this region. So in the Fried Jefferson map and in the Mitchell map, what you see is what I like to call big Virginia, where they both made Virginia just like absolutely huge. And their justification for this in a lot of times is sort of the C2C -C charter idea where, you know, we got this charter from the king. It says we have all of it. So we have all of it. Here's my map showing you that we have all of it. And Evans, interestingly enough, is not doing that. He's much more interested in treaties than these sort of large charter claims. He's interested in international treaties and he's interested in treaties with indigenous people. And he's especially interested in treaties with the Six Nations because he believes that it's through treaties with the Six Nations that the British have the strongest claim to the Ohio country. So he's saying basically we are allied with the Six Nations, um, which means that their land is basically our land, which I don't know if the Haudenosaunee would agree with that, but anyway. Um, and because of that, that's our best claim. And so in order to make 
that means something, he has to be very careful about where exactly that land is. So that's why he's being so careful here. Um, it makes it very useful and very interesting, especially for modern historians trying to um, do indigenous history, learn more about the peoples that were there. But for Evans's purpose, it's purely geopolitical. It's purely because saying, if we know where the Haudenosaunee are, we know what territory is British, and the French have no claim there. And this is a quote from the pamphlet where he says this explicitly. Again, it's really helpful when um, makers of maps write 34-page pamphlets telling you exactly why they're making the decisions that they're making. I highly recommend it to everyone in the past. I don't know why they weren't all doing it. Um, but I hope that that also lays the groundwork for, I think, the sort of most important point I really want to emphasize and make about the Evans map, which is that it's meant as a practical tool. This is a map that's meant to be used, and it's a, ma it's a map that's meant to be um, as practical as possible. What Evans wants is for the British to get out there, take control of the Ohio Valley, um, and save us all from French tyranny, essentially. And to do that, he's created a map which is um, not so much ideological as some of our other maps are, where they're just sort of saying this is British and therefore it's British, but he has put as much detail as possible in here so that people can actually get from the coastal British colonies into the Ohio country, have the kind of information they would need to form settlements, know where to site settlements, know where to site forts, uh, know how, which rivers are passable, know how to cross them, know where the gaps in the mountains are. Very, very practical information. In fact, you know, it even goes so far as to, um, on the left margin of the map, he has this whole little chart telling you the, how long the days are in each latitude of the map, which I don't totally understand how it works, but it's an impressive move uh, that he's doing there. It's, it's very, very detailed and very, very practical. So yeah, in this, this sort of section of the map that I, I excerpted it just to give you some examples of the kind of detail that's on here. And at the end of the talk, I'll do a bit more detail showing you specifically the kinds of information that's on this map. But in this, for example, you can see, you know, he's made annotations how this area, it's, it's pretty rapid, so you might want to be careful. Um, he's talking about like there's some ancient sculptures, um, up at the top, you can see he's talking about an area where he can get coal and whetstone, so resources are very important to him. He talks about locations of portages, and again, this very, very detailed, very specific information that is meant to be used. This is not, people did have this on their wall, but it was not primarily meant for that. It was not primarily meant to be a pretty object. It was primarily meant to be something to use. Um, and this is from the advertisement where, again, he tells us that. Thank you, Lewis Evans, for being so very clear about your intentions here. Um, where he goes into some detail about how he has inserted information about natural resources, about locations of coal, about locations of good level land, about which rivers are rapid or not, specifically to help in the siting of settlements um, and to make the area more accessible to the British. Okay. So to show the way in which the Evans map was a practical tool that was meant to be used and was in fact used, I want to talk about our our boy, George Washington, um, a little bit more. George Washington is often very frustrating um, to historians and others who are studying him because um, unlike Evans, he sometimes has a tendency to not actually tell us why he's doing things. Um, he can be kind of vague, he can be kind of frustrating, and I hear some laugh laughter from staff members in the room because they know what I'm talking about. However, with the Evans map, he actually comes as close as I've ever seen him to telling us both an opinion about a map and then showing his work. So this is from 1784. So again, this map was published in 1755. So this is you know many years after the map had been published where Washington is praising the map um, as much as he praises anything um, in which he says that considering the early period in which the map was made, basically, it's done with amazing exactness. And he is still actively using this map as late as 1784, which is really impressive. Um, and then if we go back in time, so this is where we get sort of an explicit statement of, of Washington saying how much he values this map and how, how good he thinks this map is. If we go back in time, we can see the ways in which he's using it. And overall, I found seven different references specifically to the Evans map in his papers. Um, there may be more, but that's what I was able to find. Um, one of the earlier ones is in 1756. So, you know, the year after the map has been published, Washington is actively in the Virginia militia, a, a very high up. Um, and he makes many, several mentions of how basically the only map he has to help him direct military operations is the Evans map. And he says that here explicitly. He's in Winchester. Um, he's writing to Adam Stephen. 
Um, and he says, uh, you would like a map of the lakes. The only map I have is Evans. You have it too, so I'm not going to give you my copy, basically. But again, that speaks to the importance of this map. This is the map that he has. This is the tool that he has to figure out what's going on in this area um, and how he can best direct military operations during the Seven Years' War, um, which is precisely sort of what Evans was anticipating. And then he keeps using it. So in the American Revolution, when Washington is again in a position of military command, um, he several times brings up the Evans map, which is still seems like the main map that he's using to consider this Ohio River Valley region, even again, decades after it's been published. So this is a um, letter from a letter that he wrote to Lachlan McIntosh, who was um, the commander of, of, in the West at this point, um, where they're laying out plans for a military expedition towards uh, Fort Niagara or Fort Detroit, I believe. I'm happy to be corrected on that. Um, but basically, Washington is talking about um, you know, how we need to know what's going on in the area around Fort Pitt. Um, and I'm looking at the Evans map right now, and what it looks like is the best place for us to establish forts to really, you know, know what's going on here, take control of the area, um, is at you know, Kittening and Wenango, which I, I take for Wenango, um, on the Evans map. So again, you can imagine him sort of sitting there physically, with Evans map in front of him, thinking through the logistics of this Western theater of the war and using the Evans map to help him do that. So just to show you that as proof that he is in fact looking at the Evans map, here's the relevant area of the Evans map. Um, Fort Duquesne became Fort Pitt, more or less, so that's Pittsburgh, and then the Kittening and Winango that he's referring to. And you can see he's using the same spelling. Um, so he's very much like looking at the map and thinking through it. Interestingly enough, Kittening and Winango are both, um, at the time of the map, they're um, indigenous towns um, that were destroyed during the war period. Great. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit now about how this map got made. So I've talked a lot about how much detail it has. Um, and so you've got to think, well, okay, well, then how did he make it? You know, we didn't have GPS. Uh, we didn't have photography. We didn't have, like, weird drones you could fly over the land and, like, take pictures. Didn't have any of that. And this is an area that is very large and impossible, really, for one individual to survey on their own, which is not what Lewis Evans did, of course. Although, I should mention, because I kind of sped through the biographical details, so maybe I'll take a brief moment to go back about Lewis Evans. Lewis Evans was Welsh. He was born about 1700. Um, by the time the map was published in 1755, he was already considered to be one of the best, if not the best, surveyors in Pennsylvania, which is where he lived and worked. Um, and so this was really a ambition of his. This, this was his idea. Unlike some other maps, this was not a situation where someone came to him and was like, hey, we need this map, although there was, there was some of that in the air. Um, but he, 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 a lot of this was coming from Evans himself. Um, so how, do we, how did he make this map? And again, do you know how we know how Evans made the map? Well, no, it wasn't George Washington, Sam. No, he told us. He tells us. Yay. <laughs> so in his pamphlet, George Washington, please. <laughs> um, in his pamphlet, he talks about his sources, which is fantastic. As a historian, I love this. This is so helpful. No one ever does this. Thank you, Lewis Evans. Um, so from that, we know that some of his sources included an earlier map that he made. So this is a 1749 map that Lewis Evans made. Um, as, as you can see, a much smaller geographic area. A lot of this based on surveys that he did himself. He was also using the Fried Jefferson map, which was the subject of our last talk. He explicitly calls out the Fried Jefferson map in many places. Um, and in addition to that, he was using um, the one that just popped up there is original surveys. That's a survey of the boundary line between Massachusetts and Connecticut. So he was um, drawing on his personal networks to get original manuscript surveys that he could consult for creating this map. Um, and then he was also talking to individual informants. So this is William Franklin, um, Benjamin Franklin's erstwhile son, with whom he had a conflicted relationship. Um, and as an aside, my absolute favorite burn in a will that I've ever read um, is in Benjamin Franklin's will, um, where he only leaves his son William, who was a loyalist, um, his lands in Canada, which had already been repossessed by the crown, as a sort of like, well, you know, this, you wanted this to happen, so you can have that land, William. Just, ugh, rough. Anyway, <laughs> this is a happier time before that. Um, and Evans was close to the Franklin family, Frank, Franklin family, as we'll see shortly. So one of the sources he, he says that he's using is a manuscript journal made by William Franklin during a diplomatic trip that Franklin took towards the land of the Six Nations. 
Um, and he is also using oral informants in the form of traders and indigenous people. So this is an image from a map cartouche. Um, but just to give you an idea of he is also talking specifically to individuals who have a lot of experience on the land, including at least one named in, in, uh, indigenous individual who he refers to as the eagle. So he's casting a pretty wide net. He's using published maps. He's using manuscript maps. He's using manuscript journals and also published information about, about colonial borders. And he's really getting out there talking to traders, talking to indigenous people to get the details that he wants and he needs about this land. And put those all together and you get this. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the enthusiasm. Um, OK, so as we mentioned, um, the story of this map is, doesn't, is not quite the same as the Fry Jefferson map or as the Mitchell map, which if you went over the Fry Jefferson map, you'll remember. Um, for those of you who are at the Fry Jefferson map, does anyone remember this guy? Exactly, thank you, Deb. Deb in the back said that he's my favorite and he's my problematic favorite. I wanna be very clear about that. Um, the Earl of Halifax was the sort of, uh, he was the president of the Board of Trade. He was responsible for a lot of the mapping projects that got off the ground during this moment because he, because again of this contentious moment with the British and the French, he wanted as much geographic information as he could get. However, this story's not about him. Um, instead, it's more about this guy, our, our friend, the ubiquitous Benjamin Franklin. Um, so I already mentioned that Lewis Evans, in many ways, this was sort of his idea, and he's talking, Lewis Evans is talking about his ambitions for a map of the whole, all of the middle colonies as early as 1743, which is really quite early. And by 1753, he's talking really seriously about wanting that this is now the time. This is the time to make this map. Things are heating up in the Ohio country that we need this. Um, and where he goes for assistance is not this guy, boo. It's this guy. He goes to the Pennsylvania legislature and he gets them to vote him uh, money to help fund this project. So they vote 50 pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot. And it, in some ways it is and in some ways it is. And it was enough, right? It's enough to get this off the ground. Um, and with that 50 pounds, he's able to commission a local Philadelphia printer who can make this copper uh, plate. So the physical process of making these maps, you would take your sketches, you would have to engrave them onto a copper plate, which is a very complex um, task that I understand very little of. Um, but it, I know that it's, it's, it's very technical and difficult. Um, and then you use that uh, to, you ink it, and you use that to create additional maps. You can get about 2,000 maps off of a single copper plate, um, but maybe only about 500 that are decent. So this can be quite um, intensive, especially if you have a large run. Um, it's, it's a real sink of money and time. So he does it locally. He does not have the money to get a good, fancy London printer, uh, like the Fry Jefferson guys were able to do because of the intercession of this guy. Um, Instead, again, he goes local. And this is really one of the reasons why the Evans map is so important is because in many ways it is, um, it is not the first, but it is perhaps the first really prominent map made in the colonies, not just by colonial people, but made actually in the colonies. So it's printed in Philadelphia first. Later it gets printed in London, but it's printed in Philadelphia first, um, which is very cool, you know, patriotic, yay. Um, but it does have some drawbacks. And it is part of the reason why the Evans map is significantly smaller than either the Fry Jefferson map or the Mitchell map, as we'll see. Uh, so just for a sense of scale, this is the Fry Jefferson map, uh, which I talked about last time. It is a four sheet map, which means you have to stitch four sheets together. The Evans map is only a one sheet map. So it's like a quarter of the size of the Fry Jefferson map, even though it's actually looking at a much, much larger geographical area. Um, the Fry Jefferson map is just Virginia. The Evans map is all of the Ohio River, uh, River Valley area. And as a result, um, it's very crowded looking. Um, it gives the impression of an object that really has like a lot going on. And especially in the more coastal areas, it could be kind of, it could be seen kind of muddy. And that's because it is so much smaller. So you can really see that in this detailed comparison of roughly the same area between the Fry Jefferson map and the Evans map, where the Fry Jefferson map looks kind of like spacious um, and clean, and the Evans map is like very kind of muddy and um, a little bit more difficult to see what's going on. Although there's also, you might also notice that there is actually, in fact, more information on the Evans map. And so I think that that really emphasizes what the difference is here. It's smaller, but it's denser. And then the other thing that I would point out here is I mentioned um, previously about um, 
Evans's reliance on uh, treaties rather than necessarily charters. Um, and he says uh, in his pamphlet that he has really only wanted to be clear about boundaries when they've been settled. So he's only drawing in the, the thick lines between colonies when he knows that this is a settled issue. And in areas where it's a bit more amorphous, he's kind of like left it a bit amorphous. So in the Fred Jefferson map, you can see he's like very confident about what is and what isn't Pennsylvania um, in a way that's like a little bit suspicious, actually. Um, same thing with Maryland. And Evans, as you can see, he's kind of like, eh, which is much more accurate, honestly. Okay, so that is the Evans map. Um, I want to tell a brief story about some of the afterlives of this map. Um, and then I want to look a little bit at some details of the map before I let you all go, go look at the actual map itself. Again, for those of you that are here in person, it's just in the next room if you go down the hall to the right. Uh, for those of you who are, who are with us online, hello, thank you, welcome. Um, you can find that on argomaps.org, A-R-G-O-M-A-P-S dot O-R-G in any browser. Check it out. Um, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about copyright. And copyright is one of these things where you either really love it or you're like confused and terrified of it. Um, I tend to be more confused and terrified of it. Um, however, and I want to shout out specifically a friend of mine, Norris Lenimsky, whose book is coming out soon on copyright in early America. For, so for those of you in the room that are really excited about copyright or have loved ones who are really excited about copyright, keep your eyes peeled for that. And she was really the one that, that brought my attention to this specific aspect of the Evans map, which is that it becomes a really interesting uh, case about copyright, in part because it is first published in the colonies, right? So you can see at the bottom of this excerpt, um, you know, it's published by an act of parliament. So he, he, Lewis Evans went out of his way to get an agent in London to be his official agent, to be the one who was creating, um, you know, legitimate copies of this map. And essentially, it all fell apart immediately. Um, no one paid attention. The map was pirated endlessly and chronically. Um, and it became a really um, out of control situation that really Lewis Evans saw and he hated. Um, and it became especially problematic because uh, Lewis Evans, um, who had a young daughter and, who's, and Lewis Evans' wife, um, who was a close friend of Ben Franklin's wife, uh, passed away pretty young before the creation of this map. Um, Lewis Evans, uh, he, he, he died, unfortunately, as we all do. But he died uh, only about a year after the publication of this map. In fact, when he was in jail for libel against uh, Robert Hunter, the governor of New York, um, something that I can't find any more information about at this moment, and it is driving me insane, so check this space for updates, because I really need to know more. Um, but he, he passes away at the, sort of the height of the map's popularity when he did not have any control um, over the, the copyright of it, when there were all of these pirated maps already being created. And then his daughter, Amelia, um, when she comes of age, spends the next couple of decades trying to get it back under control. It's one of her only sources of income. Um, and there are many letters from Amelia to Ben Franklin in particular of her talking about her attempts to enforce this essentially unenforceable copyright, uh, which is kind of a fun and interesting story, um, I think, and really says something as well about um, the, the ways in which these maps were sources of knowledge, but they were also objects in themselves, and also really this contested and interesting and weird idea of copyright and how it works at an imperial system. So that's just a side. And then you can also see in this, um, in this image that I've cropped out uh, another one of the practical features of the map, which is a table of distances that Lewis Evans has created between different areas. So you can see exactly um, how far things are from one another, which is a feature that Washington actually also used uh, extensively. Okay. So I want to end this talk, um, as I ended my, my previous one, looking at a few sort of close-ups of the map itself. And again, you'll see in these what I'm talking about when I say that there's kind of a muddy quality to this map, despite, despite and in fact, because of the density of information. I wanted, of course, to start with a close-up of the area in which we were in, because the point of maps is to find your house on them. I've said this before. I believe this very strongly. Uh, my house is, like, up there. Anyway, um, so what you can see here is in comparison to a map like the Fry Jefferson map, which is very interested in individual landholders, um, Evans isn't. We don't really have any individual landholders. But interestingly enough, he does actually have the location of the former Pis uh, Piscataway Fort, which is across the um, Potomac River from where we are right now. So again, this is just a sense both of, so this is what your house looks like, and also the different priorities that Evans has in comparison to other map makers. 
Now I want to just like uh, give you some more really specific details um, about some of the, the, the detail that is in this map. So one of the reasons that this map is famous, especially in sort of latter day, is that it appears to be the first map with a specific reference to the presence and locations of petroleum. So this is a map that is beloved of the oil industry for that reason. I believe we had a tour not too long ago where we pulled this map out to show some representatives from the oil and gas industry. Uh, because among the other natural resources that Lewis Evans is interested in cataloging for you is in fact petroleum, which is kind of neat. And it is not the only thing he's interested in showing you. So again, this is from that um, advertisement where he's talking specifically about his reasons for including all of this detail. So I just want to walk you through this one area and show you really the density of some of the information on this map. So as you can see, this is part of Lake Erie, um, where on this map he is highlighting, for example, indigenous uh, villages. So these highlights are all areas where there are indigenous villages. He is showing us portages. Um, so all of these little highlighted areas are areas where you can portage across a river. And this is, again, all the way out by Lake Erie. This is far beyond the reaches of, of colonial settlement at this time. And this is the level of detail that he's going into. Um, he even shows you like, the route across Lake Erie that you would go in a canoe if you wanted to get across it. Um, he's also, again, showing you uh, some of the conditions of the rivers themselves. Uh, so he indicates, you know, it's pretty gentle here, but then there's no falls down here. Um, but over in other places, there might be rapids or rocks, so you're going to want to avoid those. Again, extremely detailed, extremely practical. And then he's also showing you uh, these resources. So I already mentioned the petroleum. Um, in this one, he's specifically pointing out coal. Coal comes up a lot on this map, of course, as an important resource, um, as well as level and rich lands where you can imagine that you could have a settlement, you could have farmland. So again, extremely practical. Not great for siting your house, great for siting a town, perhaps, or another colonial uh, venture or project. Well, that is all I have for you today. Um, thank you so, so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I've really been enjoying doing these talks. Um, if you are interested in the fried, talk on the Fried Jefferson map, um, that has been posted on our YouTube channel. So if you go to the Mount Vernon YouTube channel and you go to the live stream section, you will find it there. Um, and then if you would like to learn more about another map from this period, the Mitchell map of, Br of the British and French Dominions in North America, which I like to think, think of as like the Google base layer map, um, of the 18th century, um, then you can join us on December 18th. And again, that will be either hybrid um, or in person, and I do hope to see some of you there. So again, you can go and see the map if you're here in person. Um, and thank you so much. I really appreciate you all coming here today. Thank you.